Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. Last week, we were continuing the discussion of the fourth foundation of mindfulness with regard to the six sense spheres. In particular, we examined the instruction in the Satipatthana Sutta to know how fetters arise dependent on the six sense bases, that is eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, how those fetters arise, how they can be removed, and how they can be prevented from arising. Remember in this whole discussion, fetter is really another word for suffering. And so what the Buddha is really talking about is suffering and the end of suffering, how it arises, how it can be removed, how it can be prevented. And as we mentioned, as we discussed, this contemplation involves a basic understanding of the law of dependent origination. The links that lead from the raw data of the sense impressions, just that basic data of sensory experience, mind included, we trace the links from the sense impressions through contact, feeling, desire, grasping, action. And becoming aware of this chain of conditioning, it highlights the critical importance of mindfulness in cutting the conditioned reactivity of the mind. We need to understand the process by which our mind gets caught. And if we can see the links and become mindful of them at the critical places, That's the way of unhooking from the chain of reactivity. We also talked about how experience at the sense spheres leads also to feeling and perception. Perception being the way we recognize and interpret experience. And the very important understanding that our perceptions do not reflect some ultimate truth, but they are colored and conditioned by various influences in the mind. Now, these influences could be just basic karmic predispositions, you know, as basic as being born a human being with a particular sensory apparatus that conditions how we perceive things. A fly would probably perceive things in very different ways than we do because it has a different sensory apparatus. So perceptions are conditioned by karmic predispositions. This cultural conditioning behind how we perceive things And this is also very much influenced by language. Our our language determines to a large extent the way we see and understand things. And on the deepest level, our perceptions are conditioned by the latent tendencies in the mind of greed, desire, hatred, and delusion. As a Buddhist scholar, uh, his name is Runa Johansson, and he wrote, just had one, one sentence here that kind of captures this. He said, things are seen through the lenses of our desires, prejudices, and resentments, and are transformed accordingly. Right? And so we're seeing things through the lenses of our conditioning, and often through the fetters or the defilements. And even simple perceptions, just very simple basic sense impressions, can be mistaken. We often mistake one thing for another. 
just one little story about this. Years ago, I was doing a retreat in Australia, uh, and I was doing walking meditation. It was near where the cars were parked. And I was walking back and forth, and I saw this bird underneath the back bumper of the car, and it was like a chrome bumper. And all of a sudden, I saw the bird fly into the bumper and then get knocked back down to the ground. So I kind of... (laughs) I was a little surprised, and I was looking carefully. And then I saw that when the bird was under the bump, it was seeing its reflection. You know, and so he thought it was another bird. <laughs> so he went to attack the other bird. And of course, every time he hit the bumper, he just got knocked back down again. Does it sound familiar? <laughs> so there's a basic, often there's just basic misperceptions you know, of very simple things with consequences. Now, the Buddha spoke of four great hallucinations of perceptions. And these keep us bound to the wheel of samsara, the wheel of conditioned existence. And he called them hallucinations, hallucinations of perception, Because with respect to happiness, with respect to freedom, we're perceiving things erroneously. But even as we're perceiving things erroneously, we think we're perceiving things correctly. And that's why we stay bound up on this wheel, this wheel of conditioning. So what are these four important distortions of perception that the Buddha was highlighting? Because it's essential for us to really see this and come out of our misperceptions of some basic truths. So first he said, the first hallucination of perception is that we take what's impermanent to be permanent. Now, when I first came across this statement, this teaching, my immediate reaction was one of denial, meaning, I don't do this. I know things are impermanent. But knowing it intellectually, or even knowing it at times experientially, is not the same thing as living in this understanding moment to moment. And that's what our practice is about, that we get so clear about the truth of impermanence that we're actually living in that space. Now, a good feedback for us for when we're lost in this hallucination of perception, taking what's impermanent to be permanent, is whenever we notice clinging or attachment. Because when there's clinging or attachment, what that means is that in those moments, at those times, we are not seeing clearly and we are not experiencing deeply the truth of change, the truth of impermanence. We're deluded into thinking that a particular experience in some way, is worth holding on to. Now, all of this does not suggest that we close off to experience. Rather, it's about opening to the perception of impermanence and not holding on, not grasping. So the first hallucination of perception is taking what's impermanent to be permanent and to notice the many times a day when we do this. The second hallucination is taking what is unattractive to be attractive, to take what is not beautiful to be beautiful. And there are many examples of how we are beguiled by superficial appearances, 
leading to erroneous perception, which then become the cause of desire, of craving, of clinging. And what's so amazing about the depth of this hallucination is that we're often denying evidence to the contrary. You know, we're so attached to seeing the attractive. Just think for a moment of the billion-dollar cosmetic industry. What is it doing? Its basic mission is to make us perceive things as being more beautiful than they are to perceive ourselves as more beautiful than we are, to perceive other people as more beautiful. And it's like a cover. Okay, and maybe more immediately for you. you know, maybe you're not so seduced by that one. Years ago, uh, the Cambodian monk, Mahago Sunanda, who I'm, most of you probably know, he, he died recently. Uh, there were ceremonies for him. But he had come... Uh, to IMS, to a three-month retreat. And something very interesting happened. He led the yogis in the hall in an eating meditation. And he did it just in a very systematic way, you know, having them take some food and then, you know, be chewing and tasting, but then really becoming aware of what happened to the food in the mouth. Beautiful, isn't it? And then swallowing, and then, you know, going down, and then being in the stomach, and being digested, and through the whole digestive system, and then coming out as excrement or waste. And he really had people kind of visualizing this whole process. And not an uncommon reaction, after having led the yogis through this, where people were asking, why does he have so much aversion to eating, so much aversion to food? That's how it was interpreted, you know, because of our attachment, our denial of just, he was just leading people through what actually is happening, you know, what the experience is. But we don't like to see it. So this is a deep, this is a deep conditioning that we have, and it's helpful to really look at the different ways it manifests in our lives. The third hallucination of perception that the Buddha talked about is taking what is suffering and unsatisfying to be happiness, to be what brings us satisfaction. And there's one statement that we find in the text of the Buddhas that just points this out in a very dramatic way. And it's a statement that always kind of sparks my attention very vividly. It's a statement that calls into question our basic assumptions about life and what we think is of value. He said... What the world calls happiness, I call suffering. And what the world calls suffering, I call happiness. Well, that's quite a commentary on how we live and the choices we make. It's a great challenge to our usual modes of perception. So what is it that the world calls happiness? Mostly, it's the enjoyment of sense pleasures, you know, mind included. This is generally what we think of, or what people generally think of, as, as happiness. We, sen- we spend so much time seeking the next hit of pleasant experience, or maybe working hard for some future pleasure, some anticipated pleasure. But since they're all impermanent, we never come to rest in this process. It's always seeking the next one, 
precisely because they don't last. And sometimes we're enticed by a minor pleasure that actually masks a great suffering. You know, we see this in the various kinds of addictions. When the mind gets addicted very often to harmful substances, right, there's an immediate pleasure hit, and yet can be the cause of huge suffering in people's lives. And sometimes it's in more ordinary ways. I recently just read a little article about people people who go to rock concerts or you know with mp3 players or listening listening to music that often people are listening at such a volume that it actually does damage to the hearing and i thought here we are thinking this is happiness <laughs> right where things are really amped up in this really loud music. And so we're taking it to be happiness, but it's actually causing harm because we're not seeing, we're not paying attention on a certain level. And in this hallucination of perception, taking what is suffering to be happiness, very often... We're deluded into thinking that wanting itself is happiness. How much email spam do you get? Kind of with the headline, increase your desire. (laughs) And not only an email spam, you know, how much is that the message that we get in our whole culture? Increase your desire and you will be happy. basic hallucination of perception. Have you ever had the experience? It's been striking. I've, I've noticed it at different times in myself. Sometimes of getting an idea in our minds that there's something that we just must have or must do. Yeah, and the almost obsessive quality that drives us until we either get it or at some point, maybe it goes away. And all the while, as we're being driven by this desire, this, this kind of obsession, even about small things, we think, oh, this is happiness. Until the desire finally does go away, and if we're paying attention, do you know that moment of relief? Of just, it's like being let out of the grip of something. Whew. And we come back to a place of ease. So much of what the world calls happiness, the Buddha sees as suffering. And when we pay attention, of course, we can too. And what the world calls suffering, things like renunciation, restraint of the sense doors, Silence, simplicity, environments with few distractions and no entertainment. Does that sound familiar? (laughs) This is what the Buddha calls happiness because of the ease, the open-heartedness, you know, the peace of mind that they bring. And of course, we all know this. This is why you're here, having recognized this. But have you ever tried to explain to somebody who's never been on a retreat why you're coming? (laughs) Yeah. I once tried to explain this to a niece of mine. And you don't talk to people? You can't listen to music? There's no shopping? (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's just hard to comprehend what in the world could be enjoyable about that. (laughs) what the world calls suffering, the Buddha calls happiness. Seeing through this hallucination of perception, where we really see things more accurately, 
can be the basis for a great compassion to arise. Now, it's said that after the Buddha's enlightenment, as he was surveying the world with his eye of wisdom, that what most moved him to begin teaching was the compassion that arose when he saw how all beings were seeking happiness and yet doing the very things that cause suffering. You know, in our own experience, to the degree that we awaken, that we've had glimpses or tastes of where a true happiness lies, it really can strengthen our aspiration of bodhicitta. You know, yes, let me awaken. May I awaken for the benefit of all, to really help people see where happiness lies. So we take what is impermanent to be permanent. We take what is unattractive to be attractive. We take what is suffering to be happiness. All of these are hallucinations of perception. The last one, the fourth one, is taking what is not self to be self. Of course, this is very deeply rooted We see it happening many times a day. Every time we identify with some sensation in the body, we identify with a thought, with an emotion. We are taking what is not self to be self. Or we can identify and often do with the knowing of it all. Even as we may be seeing the changing nature, the selfless nature of arising phenomena, on a more subtle level, we can be identifying with the knowing, creating the sense of an observer, of a witness to it all. And so on that level, we're taking what is not self to be self. Quite a few years ago, I had a very vivid experience of this particular hallucination of perception, and it really involved a deep understanding of myself. It had to do with a distortion of perception that was tremendously influencing how I was living my life and how I was relating to people. It was a time when I was experiencing a lot of fear arise, both in my meditation practice and also just in ordinary life situations. It just, fear was up. You know, it was coming many different times and sometimes very intensely. And as I was experiencing this, you know, over quite a stretch of time, I started creating this story about myself as being this really fearful person, you know, with such incredibly deep roots in my conditioning. And I just built this self-story, and I started believing it. And I thought, these roots go so deep, this is going to take an immense effort and years of therapy to unwind, you know, to really come out of the prison of this conditioning. And I was believing it. I was believing this this story so completely of my being this really fearful person because it was grounded in the experience of a very real emotion. The fear was arising. Then once I was, during this period, I was teaching a retreat with Sharon Salzberg in Texas. And we were down there and we were just going for a walk after lunch. And I was going on and on about my fear and what kind of person I was and it was so deep. And and she just turned to me and it was one of those moments. And she looked at me and she said, Joseph, it's only a mind state. You know those moments when things are just right and you can hear something and it clicks? 
it just cut through that whole hallucination of perception of taking the fear to be self, which is what I was doing. I was taking what was not self to be self and creating a whole big story around it. Again, seeing this doesn't mean closing off to the emotion. That's not the implication. And it certainly still arises at different times. But it's very different to see the fear or whatever other emotion might be. Might be. It's very different to see it as a passing mind state than being imprisoned in the big story of self we can build around it. A very useful reminder at these times, when we feel ourselves caught in a story, a big story of self, of how we are, is that awareness is already free. Nothing is limiting us except the brushwork of our own imagination and projections. This is the hallucination of taking what is not self to be self. The freedom that we're wanting is already here. Even if it's just for a few moments at a time, we can see it, we can touch it. There's a teaching by Tibetan master Zigar Kongchul. He said, the experience of emptiness, selflessness, freedom, is not found outside the world of ordinary appearance, as many people mistakenly assume. In truth, we experience emptiness when the mind is free of grasping at appearances. So it's not some far-off state outside of our ordinary experience. Rather, we cut through this hallucination of perception, of taking what is not self to be self, when we stop grasping at, when we stop identifying with whatever it is that's arising. And it's often some big emotional story. One of the most liberating aspects of the teaching, you know, in this section of the Satipatthana Sutta, is the Buddha's recognition that because our perceptions are the results of mental habits, sometimes very deep mental habits, but they're conditioned, they're colored by our mental habits. Because of that, it also means that they can be trained. Perceptions can be trained. And this is not a small accomplishment. In one sutta, the Buddha talked of two kinds of supernormal powers. There are the ones that we are most familiar with and perhaps the most enticed by, you know, fascinated by. And you read in the suttas of people with these supernormal powers, you know, that come through the power of concentration, of being one, becoming many making multiple bodies, or flying in the air, or the divine eye and seeing other realms of existence, you know, or walking through walls, or knowing the minds of others. There's a whole list of these quite extraordinary powers. And, you know, at any point, if you're interested in them, there's a very fun section in the book on Deepa's, Deepa Ma's life, who really had mastered all of this, you know, that, it, that it talks about the things she did with Munindraji, uh, who was also her teacher as well as mine, uh, when he was training her in this. And they are quite fun to read. 
But the Buddha said, for those who are not enlightened, these supernormal powers are considered worldly because they are associated with taints. They are associated with attachments. And you could can imagine how easy it would be to become attached to flying through the air or other such things. So that's the first kind of supernormal powers he talked about. The second kind of supernormal powers are noble ones rather than worldly ones because they are not bound up with attachment and not bound up with taints. And the Buddha described these noble supernormal powers as mastery over one's perceptions. Right, so this, this is pointing to something very significant, that perceptions are colored by our conditioning, by mental habits, which means that they can be trained. And the Buddha is saying that the noble power of mind is not kind of these you know, fascinating things that can be done, but rather through the mastery over one's perceptions, how we perceive things. I'd like to just read something from Venerable Analayo's book, which is Satipatthana, The Direct Path to Realization, which is the book that inspired this whole series of talks. It's a very, very clear uh, and good book on the sutta. It emphasizes that mastery of one's perceptions comes through the development of mindfulness. That's how we accomplish this. So he wrote, the presence of mindfulness directly counteracts automatic and unconscious ways of reacting that are so typical of habits. By directing mindfulness to the early stages of the perceptual process, one can train cognition or perception and thereby reshape habitual patterns. Of central importance in this context is the receptive quality of mindfulness, which gives full attention to the cognized data. Of equal significance is the detached quality of mindfulness, which avoids immediate reactions. Okay, so he's saying, he's pointing out that it's mindfulness of the perceptual process. As sense impressions come in, mind included, the power of mindfulness, both its receptive quality and its detached quality, allows us to really see what's going on, to see all the links, and to counteract the habitual reactivity of mind. He goes on to say and to emphasize that this process does not involve thinking about things. It doesn't involve reflection or consideration, but rather to see objects from a particular perspective. It's highlighting a particular feature of an object. That's the training. It's not, it's not thinking about it. It's training ourselves to see in a certain way. So just as a, some examples of this, through the power of mindfulness of whatever it is that's arising, we can train ourselves, and we are training ourselves, to perceive the general characteristics of all experience. We're training ourselves to perceive the impermanence, the unsatisfying nature, the selfless nature. And it's, it's just so interesting because impermanence is not an esoteric feature of existence. You know, it's so obvious on all level, and yet, normally, for people untrained, generally it's not the way things are perceived. 
you know, that particular feature of existence is not highlighted in people's minds or lives. And there are consequences to not perceiving this. And there are consequences and results when we train ourselves to perceive it in this way. So it's all a matter of training. And the Buddha is pointing out to us, okay, well, what are skillful ways of perceiving that lead to happiness, that lead to the end of suffering, that lead to liberation through non-clinging? These are the ways we should train ourselves in perception. Sometimes we train ourselves in ways that are very tailored to our own particular conditioning. And there's one story from the text which I really enjoy in this regard. There was one monk who had been given the meditation object of the unattractive nature of the body. And he practiced and practiced and practiced, but was not getting any place. He was not making any progress at all in his understanding. So finally, the Buddha came to know of it. And with his great power of mind, he saw this monk's particular conditioning over many lifetimes. And he saw that, you know, for 500 lifetimes, he had been a goldsmith. And he just was completely attuned to beauty. And so the Buddha, through his psychic powers, this is the story, created a golden lotus, which gradually disintegrated. And so he was contemplating the impermanence of the beautiful. And because that fit with his conditioning, he saw the impermanence of the beautiful, and as most of these stories end up, became an arhant. So we can train ourselves in the general way, the general characteristics, but the way we do it can often be tailored to our own particular background. We can also train our perceptions to see particular char characteristics of things that might balance unwholesome tendencies in our minds. So, for example, if we have a mind that just is prone to aversion and annoyance and irritation and ill will, you know, that our mind tends to that side of the kalesis, of the defilements, then we would train ourselves, we would practice perceiving the good in people practice perceiving what is beautiful in people because that perception is the condition for metta to arise, the condition for loving kindness to arise. So it's through our training in particular ways that we can counterbalance different unskillful tendencies. Or if ill will is not our thing, but we're more ensnared by lust, you know, and we just find ourselves filled with lustful fantasies, lust in the mind, lustful thoughts, then perceiving the unattractive nature of the body would serve us better. And there's one whole section of the Satipatthana Sutta, which talks about, I forget the number, eight or nine different ways contemplating decaying corpses. So if you're filled with lust, <laughs> it's not so easy to find decaying corpses in our culture. But it points to the side of things we would want to look at, we would want to perceive, because it would help free our mind from an unskillful tendency. And as a final training in these supernormal power, the noble ones of mastery of perceptions is abiding in equanimity. So we're perceiving in that way 
mindful and fully aware of whatever it is that's arising without reactivity. Now, in all of these different ways, you know, the general ways, the ways that might be tailored more to our own particular conditioning, what's important to remember is that when we undertake this as a training, we're making these choices of how to perceive based on wisdom, rather than having our perceptions simply being the playing out of old conditioned mental habits. In both cases, they're conditioned, but one comes out of old habit, sometimes maybe skillful, often not. And the other way, when we take it as a practice, we are actually making the choices out of wisdom, out of clear seeing. Ajahn Chah, in his just very beautiful and characteristically simple way, you know, expressed this so well. He said, within itself, the mind is already peaceful. That the mind is not peaceful these days is because it follows moods or emotions. It becomes agitated because moods deceive it. Sense impressions come and trick it into unhappiness, suffering, gladness, and sorrow. But the mind's true nature is none of these things. Gladness or sadness is not the mind, but only a mood coming to deceive us. And it's on both sides. It's gladness and sadness. Equally, moods coming to deceive us. The untrained mind gets lost and follows these things. It forgets itself. Then we think it is we who are upset or at ease or whatever. But really this mind of ours is already unmoving and peaceful, really peaceful. So we must train the mind to know these sense impressions, these perceptions, and not get lost in them. Just this is the aim of all this difficult practice we put ourselves through. It's really coming back to the natural ease of mind, practicing not getting lost. So the very last part of this section of the Satipatthana Sutta on the sense spheres has to do with the refrain which follows each set of instructions in the Sutta. Now the Buddha repeated this refrain 13 different times. Right? For each specific set of instructions, they are followed by this one refrain which, in which he highlights the way we should be using that particular instruction in our meditation. So clearly, if he repeated it 13 times in one sutta, he means for us to pay attention to it. So I'd like to read the refrain. I think I'd like to read it. Okay. So again, this, is, this comes after the instructions on the sense spheres, which I've been talking about for these past three weeks. So the Buddha said, in this way, in regard to dhammas, meaning here the sense spheres, one abides contemplating dhammas internally, externally, or both internally and externally. One abides contemplating the nature of arising, of passing away, of both arising and passing away of dhammas, of the sense spheres. Mindfulness that there are dhammas is established in one to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and continuous mindfulness. 
and one abides independent, not clinging to anything in this world. Okay, so I just want to very briefly kind of highlight a few of these points. Internally and externally, or both. It means that we notice the sense spheres and all the conditioning that follows, the fetters that arise because of them, how it operates in ourselves, and we also contemplate how it's operating in others. Because it's the same process at work in ourselves and in others. And this is an important part of our practice in terms of living it in the world, because generalizing our personal experience in this way. Yes, this is how it is working in me. This is also how it's working in everyone else. It strengthens our equanimity in relationship to other people, in our relationships with other people, because we understand from our own experience how it is that they are getting caught up in the sense fears, in perceptions, in desire, in clinging, in craving, or not. Right? So this generalization internally and then externally really serves us in our interactions with others. The more we understand how our own perceptions and points of view are conditioned, the more we can appreciate and understand how other people's points of view and perceptions are conditioned. And this is quite different than going through the world being overly attached to our way of seeing things. And we don't take it to be so ultimate. Meditation retreats, as you well know, are almost always a humbling experience because we get such a direct look and an undistracted look at the range and depth of conditioning in our minds. You know, there's no avoiding it. We're just seeing it all day, every day. But as we open to this, as we really see what our minds are doing, it also, that openness to it, it fosters a growing humility and also a growing generosity of spirit, generosity of heart. The poet W.H. Auden expressed this so well. It's this a line that I love from one of his poems. He said, love your crooked neighbor with all your crooked heart. <laughs> you know, and we just see that so immediately on retreat as we, as we make the effort to, to just observe what's going on in ourselves. And it does allow us to love our crooked neighbor with all our crooked heart. So we pay attention to the sense spheres and all the conditioning that arises from them internally and externally in both. And then the refrain goes on to say, and we contemplate the arising and passing away of experience at the sense spheres. Of course, the easiest place to see this is just in the sense objects, you know, sights and sounds and smells and tastes and sensations and thoughts, and we just pay attention to how they arise and pass away over and over and over again. And so we're seeing so clearly the impermanent nature. It takes a somewhat more refined attention to see the arising and passing away or the impermanence of the sense base. The sense objects are clear but to see the impermanence of the eye, of the ear, of the nose, of the tongue, of the body, of the mind, the sense base. But in the most simple way, we might just pay attention to the sensations that we feel at each of those sense organs, sense bases. Well, that's, that's just a very simple way of experiencing the impermanence 
at that place. The reason I think the Buddha emphasized this aspect of seeing the arising, the passing away, both the arising and passing away, so often, and why he emphasized it in the refrain, is because the insight into impermanence, the clear seeing of impermanence, is the doorway of seeing and understanding the other characteristics. It's through seeing impermanence clearly, which is obvious once we open to it, once we train our perception in this way. It's the doorway to understanding deeply the unsatisfying nature of conditioned phenomena. We know it can't offer lasting fulfillment because we see how impermanent it is. So that it's not theoretical at that point. And through the seeing of impermanence, we understand deeply the selfless nature of what arises. Because nothing lasts long enough to be self. So it all opens up through the practice of this instruction in the refrain. In the last lines of it, mindfulness that there are dharmas, meaning there are these sense fears. is established in one simply to the extent necessary for bare knowledge, just just to the extent necessary to really see how they're working, the sense fears, and continuous mindfulness. And one abides not clinging, independent, not clinging to anything in the world. You know, and so this is the Buddha's declaration of freedom, the experience of freedom. And he ends the section, that is how, in regard to dhammas, one abides contemplating dhammas in terms of the six internal and external sense fears. So we made it through this section. <laughs> it's amazing how rich, you know, like a couple of paragraphs of teachings contain so much. Mm-hmm.